Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Deborah Thien, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at California State University, Long Beach. I'm meeting with Dr. Milana Karenga to talk about black history, as well as his own history here at Cal State Long Beach. Dr. Karenga is an activist, academic, and educator. He created the African-American and Pan-African holiday Kwanzaa. He was a pioneer in the movement to establish black studies as an academic discipline, and he is the long-term chair of the Africana Studies Department at Cal State Long Beach. It is a pleasure to be with you here, Dr. Karenga. Thank you for joining me. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, I heard you first set foot on the Cal State Long Beach campus in 1967 to give a speech on the speaker's platform during the height of the Black Power Movement. Can you tell us what the atmosphere was like in Southern California at that time? Uh, yes, it was. It was a beautiful atmosphere. It's the atmosphere of massive education, mobilization, organization, and confrontation mm -hmm. in the hopes of transformation, creating a new conception of American society, mm -hmm. opening up uh, the campus uh, to a new understanding of quality education, which by definition we argued was a multi and is a multicultural education mm -hmm. with ethnic studies at the center. And so it was a very important time and a good time uh, for all of us. Uh, also, it was a time of black power, and we define black power as the collective struggle and achievement of three fundamental goals, self-determination, self-respect, and self-defense. Self-determination, that is controlling the space we occupy, controlling our institutions, and self-respect, uh, reaffirming the beauty and goodness, soulfulness, sacredness, resilience, and resourcefulness of our culture that could enable us to speak our own special culture truth and make our own unique contribution to how this society is reconceived and reconstructed. And then third, a self-defense. that We have the right and responsibility to defend ourselves against oppression, that it is right to rebel against oppression, that we have a moral responsibility, a right and responsibility uh, to resist evil and injustice and oppression wherever we find it. So it was a good time, uh, excellent dialogue all day, every evening, uh, wherever we found a space we would stop and discuss. Well, speaking of education and transformation, my son learned about Kwanzaa in elementary school, and he has been very impressed ever since that I actually know the creator, Dr. Karenga. Can you tell us uh, about creating Kwanzaa in 1966, and what were the reasons that you created Kwanzaa? Yeah. I created Kwanzaa in the context of the Black Freedom Movement, mm -hmm. right? And the Black Freedom Movement had these four aims, freedom, justice, equality, and power. And I left the uh, UCLA. I was working on my doctorate at UCLA, and I wanted to join the movement. I wanted to contribute to the movement. And I'm mindful of one of our great educators, Dr. Mayor McLeod Bethune, who said, it is up to us as intellectuals, as educated people, to discover the dawn and to share it with the masses of our people and our youth who need it most. She said, knowledge is the prime need of the hour, but people want to know why you what are you going to do with your knowledge? And she said again, it is important for us to share it with the masses, to uplift them and liberate them. So I created Kwanzaa for four basic reasons. Number one, to contribute to the movement, to the black liberation movement. Mm -hmm. So I created Kwanzaa as first an act of, of freedom, an instrument of freedom, a celebration of freedom, and a practice of freedom. An act of freedom because it was self-determinant. We didn't tried to ask the government to approve it. We celebrated it, and we made it not just national, but international. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also an instrument of freedom in that more than any other time, black people come together and discuss, you know, what it means to be African in the world. What is our role as a social and moral vanguard in this country and the world? And what does our culture obligate us to do more than any other time? And as you perhaps know, uh, Kwanzaa is celebrated all over the world, throughout the world African community, on every continent in the world. I created it also as a celebration of freedom, a celebration of our struggle to be ourselves and free ourselves, to be ourselves without penalty or, or oppression or punishment, and to free ourselves, to expand the realm of freedom in this country, and to imagine a whole new way of being African and human 
uh, in the world. So it's a beautiful. And then finally, of course, is a practice of freedom because when we practice it, we are also practicing the struggle to expand that realm of human freedom. The second reason I created Kwanzaa was to give us uh, a time to meditate on our culture, to reaffirm our rootedness in African culture because we had been lifted out of our own culture by the Holocaust of enslavement and made a footnote and negative of a factor in other people's history. So the struggle was to return to our history and culture so again we could speak our own special culture truth and make our own unique contribution to how this society is reconceived and reconstructed. And third, <clears throat> I, I created a Kwanzaa uh, to give, oh, I'm sorry, uh, fourth, I created Kwanzaa to introduce and reaffirm the importance of the seven principles, the Nguzo Saba, which are the hub and hinge on which the whole holiday turn. And these are communitarian values, values that stress, strengthen, uh, and advance cult, uh, family, community, and culture. And of course, that's the definition of, of Kwanzaa. It is a celebration of family, community, and culture. And those principles, first in Swahili and then in English, are Umoja, unity, Kujichagilia, self-determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujamaa, cooperative economics, neo-purpose, Goomba, creativity, and Imani faith. So those are the basic reasons I created. And again, I created in the context of the Black Freedom Movement. So it's an emancipatory, liberating holiday a holiday that celebrates uh, the beauty of our culture, the beauty of our people, mm -hmm. their resourcefulness, their sacredness, their resiliency, uh, and their contribution uh, to the forward flow of human history. Mm -hmm. And it is indeed a major contribution that you have made, um, you know, locally, internationally. Mm -hmm. You have many contributions in other ways. You came back to Long Beach State in 1979, and this time it was to teach, mm -hmm. to teach in the classroom. What kinds of courses did you teach, and what was the state of black studies in the late 1970s? So I taught social science classes, humanity classes, and language. I taught, like, for in political science, which was my, is my first doctorate, and, and I taught uh, ethics later, but I taught uh, black power, black politics, uh, African-American thought, contemporary uh, issues of the third world. By third world, we mean the world of color, people of color. Uh, and then I taught also uh, uh, black uh, people and the law, legal remedies. And I taught Swahili, uh, both elementary and advanced. And, uh, and one of the things I did with Swahili was uh, to get it accepted as a fulfillment for uh, graduation when that was necessary. Language, of course, is no longer necessary, which I mm. think. Uh, well, I could argue with that, but it's no longer <laughs> a, a requirement for graduation. But uh, yes, I, I did that also. And I taught also um, uh, blacks and the mass media, as well as the needs of, of the ghetto child, public education a conversation, because I do a lot of work in education also. Mm -hmm. So you didn't teach at Cal State Long Beach uh, most of the 1980s, and when you returned, you became um, a tenure-track faculty member and you became department chair. Uh -huh. So this is the leadership piece. So can you talk a little bit about your role as the chair and your scholarship during that period? Yes. So one of the things I tried to do when I came here was to, first of all, reaffirm the importance of quality education to continue the struggle we had since the 60s to open up the university so that it is an inclusive uh, project for both life and learning, right? And so the, one of the first things I did was help form what was called the President's Task Force on Multicultural Education and Campus Diversity. And I was both vice chair and then chair of that. And I worked with uh, uh, people uh, in the other ethnic studies department as well as with people from across uh, the country. And I was also a member of the WAS3, which was a provision, uh, which was a project for developing integrated undergraduate experience, right? I, I was also chair of the Faculty Diversity Committee for the California Faculty Association. I'm a union person. Uh, we used to have a progressive, uh, we used to have the, uh, a union called the Progressive Union that I, I really like, but then we changed to CFA, which is good now and excellent uh, and very important. In, in, in our uh, lives as faculty people. Also, I was on the campus 
climate communities. I was always concerned with not only an excellent environment for learning, but an excellent environment for life because they are inseparably mm -hmm. uh, linked. I was a member of the Critical Thinking Council, uh, Committee on Critical Thinking across the curriculum and helped bring uh, that in. I was a member of the GGC committee, uh, the CSULB representative uh, for for Southern California Consortium on International Studies. I represent African Studies and African Studies. And then, of course, I, we, one of the things I liked also was I got my second doctorate in uh, ethics, and this is um, social ethics. And what happened is that when I got here, there was an emerging and developing ethics studies committee across the curriculum, and I was very much active in that. It was a very a beautiful um, exchange and experience, so I appreciate it. So while I was chair and when I came back, I started on my second doctorate. I developed, I thought that one of the most important ways we can engage the world today is from an ethical standpoint. And as Africa had, uh, for us, the oldest text that I know of when I studied uh, on ethics um, and spirituality. And so I wanted to bring that into black studies. And so I was able to write an uh, 800 page uh, dissertation on Ma'at, the moral idea in ancient Egypt, a study in classical African ethics. And out of the 45,000 uh, dissertations uh, that were printed that uh, year, mine was the most requested. So that was a great honor, too. And um, Egyptologists, as well as black studies scholars, praise uh, the work. So those are some of the things I did. And of course, I worked with the Black Student Union and the African Studies Association uh, to uh, defend and, and promote the interests of our students mm -hmm. and to build relationships with the community. So uh, a union person, ethics, spirituality, um, in the classroom, in leadership. Um, you've two doctorates. I think you must be one of only a handful of people that have two doctorates on this campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe the only one, we'll have to look into that. Uh, and in addition, you've also been involved in the struggle for black studies and ethnic studies since their beginnings in the 1960s. More recently, you played a role in the achievement of the Weber Bill, AB 1460. Would you talk a little bit about that, about your leadership there and your um, engaged scholarship in, in the midst of those initiatives? One of the things I want us to do in Long Beach is to see ourselves as a site for the advancement of an inclusive excellence in the educational project. In the same way that San Francisco was the site for the beginning of ethnic studies, Long Beach was the site for the beginning of the acquisition of the institutionalization of ethnic studies through the Weber Bill AB 1460. And it started with a, a, a struggle to preserve the integrity and wholeness of black studies and it became a statewide project uh, to, in fact, defend all ethnic studies and through conversations, working at the chancellor's office, working with the chancellor as a result of the intervention of uh, the, uh, um, the California Legislative Black Caucus uh, with uh, Dr. Shirley Weber mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Holly Mitchell, uh, Assemblywoman Holly Mitchell, who is now supervisor. Dr. Weber is now, of course, Secretary of State but she had been an educator and a, she's a colleague of mine uh, on the um, National Council of Black Studies, the preeminent uh, black uh, prof studies professional organization. We worked together and we were able to meet with the chancellor uh, to ask for and, and to get uh, a task force uh, for the advancement of ethnic studies. And we used that report as the basis for the bill to say that Native American studies, African studies, Chicano Latino studies, and uh, Asian Asian American studies should become a fundamental legal part of what it means to have a quality education. So that now the 500,000 people that graduate from CSU yearly will now have to, of course, take the ethnic studies course uh, to graduate. And it's not simply a requirement. Actually, it's a necessity to understand the world you can't say you have a quality education if you just have the study of one people, no matter how important they think they are. But we have to have the study of the world. Truth is whole, and any partial approach to it leaves you with a partial answer, and the quality of your evidence suffers. So we need to teach 
the world as it is. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did in the 60s was argue for what we call a relevant education. And that meant it was meaningful to the student, that it was useful to the community, and reflective of the realities of community, society, and the world. And to be meaningful to the student, it has to respect the culture from which the student comes, right? It has to allow them to speak their own special culture, you, true, and to develop reflective problematics from the depths of their own culture and useful to the community. We can't really see knowledge for knowledge's sake. Knowledge is knowledge for human sake in our uh, pedagogy. And so we have to ask, how do we use this knowledge to in fact improve the human present and advance the human future? And so reflective of the realities of the world meant that we learn how to deal with the people of the world, not as conquerors, not as imperialists, not as colonialists, but as fellow human beings who respect the equal dignity and value of every human being. I love how you say the truth is whole. Yes. And I wondered if you could speak a little to the, the struggles of the process. So the committee, the task force comes together, you work together with Dr. Weber. Um, did you face struggles? Did you face opposition to this process? Oh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, first, people thought it would be too much, that it's going to um, uh, disrupt the educational system, and, and I understood it. And one of the beautiful things about our campus is we don't have the same kind of struggles other people have on their campus, and we made to that. Our ethnic studies faculty, especially our chairs, we have been working on always moving together uh, so that we produce not only harmony with ourselves, but reach out to our other catalog, catalog, uh, colleagues across campus that are interested in a quality education also. And we've done that since we, we, we started this. So that was the beautiful thing. So we had to have a conversation with the Academic Senate, of course. Uh, uh, we had, of course, with the Chancellor's Office, with the Academic Senate, with caucuses, ethnic studies caucuses in the assembly. We spent a lot of times, I traveled up there, as did my colleague, traveled up there to work with them on formulating support for the BIA. I testified uh, before them, gave it, uh, evidence of why this was important. They accepted it and supported it, and the governor also supported it and uh, signed it. So it was beautiful to work like that, to build community. And I think that our campus and our colleagues on campus see the value of it. For, certainly it's something new. Whenever you have something new, there are problems you have to work out. But what is important is the spirit of collaboration that we have on this campus. And I've always valued that. No matter what we disagreed on, we always work together uh, to make sure that everyone uh, got uh, what they needed. And this reminds me of an intellectual concept uh, called um, Upatanishi, uh, and it's a Swahili word uh, that means reconciliation, peacemaking, and it's based on the word patana, which means that everyone gets something of value in it. Mm. You never leave the table of negotiation until everyone gets something of value. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time on collaboration, on communication, on community building. Yes. And, and like you, I think our campus, uh, I think we have the conditions for that, but it, yes. it takes a lot of work to it do does. all of those it does. pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're meeting in February of 2023, mm -hmm. somewhat unbelievably. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, this is more than 50 years after you started your scholar activist mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. What kinds of lessons do you share with your students? What are you telling them in your classrooms? Well, I think that I would like for my students to realize certain principles. First, the principle of multicultural respect. And there are several principles with that. First and foremost is mutual respect for each people and culture mm -hmm. as a unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world. I mean, that is, Without that, we can't even go on. Unless we respect each people, each person and people, each culture as a unique and yet equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world, we can't go forward. The second is mutual respect for the right and responsibility of each people to speak its own special culture truth, to make its own unique contribution, not only to how we reconceive this country and reconstruct it, but also how we relate rightfully to the environment and the world. 
And then, of course, thirdly, it's important for them to see that even in our diversity that we respect, we have to respect that, that we constantly see common ground in the midst of our diversity mm -hmm. and asking how can we work together to build a good and just society and world we all want and deserve to live in. Mm -hmm. And finally, I teach them, they must have a mutual commitment to building a good world they want and deserve to live in. They must have an actual, active commitment, right? And they must have an ethics of sharing, mm -hmm. shared uh, status, no inferior superior people, shared knowledge, shared space in this country, in the neighborhood, in the world, shared wealth, shared power, shared interests, right? And uh, shared commitment, again, to build a good world they all want and deserve uh, to live in. I tell them that. And I also tell them, remember this. This is our duty to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. How do they take that challenge? How do they respond to that need for an, ethic, an ethics of commitment? I think that they first, they like it, and they wonder how can we do it. <laughs> and I tell them, that's the beauty of critical thinking, that critical thinking is not just criticizing, condemning people. It's wonder, that's the basis of spirituality, the basis of ethics, the basis of science, is that we wonder about the world, mm -hmm. that we wonder about ourselves, and we wonder about our potential to create good in the world. And it's important for them not to let the established order discourage them and diminish their conception of themselves in all their diversity. That is why one of the things I always tell them when they come in, don't shorten your name. People have a right and responsibility to speak your name, right? If people can say Schwarzenegger, they can say any <laughs> other language name. So I say, respect yourself, right? And demand that from other people because uh, without that, we don't have a good world. And my whole life has been dedicated to my adult life, but also when I was small, my, my adult life has been uh, dedicated to expanding the realm of human freedom and justice in the world. And that's what I uh, teach them in terms of that. There's also, uh, this last point, also talk to them about how do you conceive the education you are having? Do you think it, of it as simply a way to make a living? Or more important, do you think of it as a way to make a life? One of our great educators, Dr. Uh, uh, W. B. Doors, du Bois, said, yes, we must teach people how to make uh, a living, but we must also teach them how to make a life. So that I said in our pedagogy, Kawit is my philosophy, uh, which is an ongoing synthesis of the best of African sensitivity, thought, and practice in constant exchange of the world. We say that in that philosophy that the pedagogy, the teaching must be first to give people knowledge of the world, knowledge of themselves in the world, knowledge of how to effectively negotiate and live in the world, and finally, how to direct their lives toward good and expansive ends. So that is some of the things that I tell them mm -hmm. in the midst of any subject I teach. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to hear about the <clears throat> inculcation of curiosity and wonder and this kind of generous approach yes. to thinking through yes. thinking through the problems that we face and the challenges and the yes. opportunities. So, Dr. Krenga, what would you like your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered uh, on this campus and beyond this campus? I would like to be remembered first as one who tried his best to live the awesome legacy of my ancestors. My mother, my father, but also other people who opened the way for us. Uh, Nana Fanny Luhema, one of our great uh, activists, uh, human rights activists said, there are two things we should all care about. Never to forget where we came from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. Mm -hmm. And what better way can we praise the bridges than carried us over 
and then to try to live the beautiful legacy, the model and mirror that they left us. I, what, what else? So that's my first thing. And, and what they taught me was from the sacred text. That, it's in the Old Dewey Five sacred text, Old Dewey Five says, uh, let's do things with joy, for surely humans have been divinely chosen to bring good into the world, and that this is a fundamental mission and meaning of human life. So I tried to do that. I recognize and I reaffirm, I want people to know that I tried my best to answer the mandate of both heaven and history to bring good into the world. And that we say is basically to seek and achieve African and human good and the ongoing sustained well-being of the world. And I also want to be named, remembered by my name my name represents my identity, my purpose, and my direction. My name is Maulana Ndabizita Karenga. It's Pan-African. Maulana is Swahili, Ndabizita is Zulu, and Karenga is Gikuyu. And I chose those names for me, and I accepted. I chose one, and I accepted two others because it's Pan-African, and I'm a Pan-African. I don't choose one ethnic group in Africa, one country. I choose a whole continent as my heritage and all the people as my relative on the continent and in the diaspora. So my name is Marlana, so this is, this is what I want to be remembered as first, as a master teacher, a person who loved learning, who listened to the ancestors who said, love learning, better is a book than a well-built house, better is a book than a memorial plaque in the temple. Study always study the functioning and structure of the earth. Study the function and structure of the universe. Never say you're wise, but continue to learn so that you will uh, be able to live a good and meaningful life. And so the Husea says that, and I, I take it very seriously that. And the, so I, I, I believe that as, as a master teacher, and, and the movement gave my organization, us, and the movement gave me that. They said, you can teach. But I, wanted, I said to them in all humility, I learn. I love learning. I love reading. You know, I, I study, um, I did my dissertation. I used eight languages, four African and, and four European. And I like to study these cultures. I like my own first. I started as my foundation. Well, I don't run around the world, you know, uh, praising other people and miss myself. So I start with what it is to be African. I constantly question Africa. I dialogue with African culture throughout the world, ancient and modern. I, I, I excel, of course, from one of my uh, main uh, fields, of course, is classical African ethics. But I study other uh, uh, cultures uh, at the same time. So. That, I want to say I did what I could uh, to teach and to share the knowledge that I had, the knowledge of this awesome legacy. Second is uh, my uh, name, Ndavizita, Zulu, literally for constant concern to the oppressor. And it translates for us as a constant soldier, never unready, the Odu if I say, a constant soldier is never unready, not even once always ready to serve and sacrifice, to dedicate, to demonstrate discipline, to demonstrate commitment to good, to achieving good in the world. And we think about that in terms of, as I said, I wrote the uh, mission statement for the Million Man March, uh, Day of Absence, and one of the things I said, let us so live and act in our struggle that people will say that they live, as Dr. King said, a great people, an African people, and that I'm part of that, that I did try to speak truth, to do justice, to honor my elders and my ancestors, to cherish and challenge my children, to care for the poor and the vulnerable, to have a rightful relationship with the environment, to constantly struggle against evil, injustice, and oppression, and to always embrace, pursue, and raise up the good. Last name, Karenga, keeper of the tradition. I want to be known as a person that loved his people, loved his culture, and saw it as an infinite source of some of the most important 
ideas in human history. For example, in my dissertation, I discussed the African introduction in the Nile Valley civilization of Egypt, the concept of human dignity. Shepesu is the word. And the Shepesu is trans, has three characteristics to it. Shepesu means dignity, inherent worthiness, which has three characteristics. It's transcendental, that is beyond all social and biological characteristics, race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ability, nationality, religion, etc. Second, it's equal in all, no hierarchy. And third, it's inalienable. Not only can you give, uh, it can be taken away from, it can not only not be taken away from because it's inherent, but you can't even give it away, right? So I think those are the things I like to bring forward. And I share with my students in my class these ideas. The last idea I share, and I think is so important for our culture, is the concept of Saruj Ta, the moral imperative to constantly repair, renew, and remake the world, making it more beautiful and beneficial than we inherit it. And that means to raise up what is in ruin, to repair what is damaged, to rejoin what is separated, to replenish what is depleted, to set right what is wrong, to strengthen what is weakened, and to make flourish that which is fragile and undeveloped. This is our duty. Well, thank you, Dr. Krenga, for acknowledging the bridges, for building the bridges, for being the bridge. Uh, thank you for the insight and the inspiration. Thank you. Enjoyed our conversation. As did I. Mm -hmm.